StatQuest. It's a live stream. Hooray, StatQuest. Hello, I'm Josh Starmer, and welcome to my StatQuest live stream. I'm really excited you guys are here, and one of the reasons is I have got a big, huge announcement to make. Um, the big, huge announcement is starting today, StatQuest is my full-time job. On Friday, I went to uh, the lab, and that was my last day at my old job. And now, when I woke up this morning, I went to StatQuest HQ, World HQ, and I spent the whole day doing StatQuest, and it was awesome. Uh, this is awesome for many reasons. One is, is that you'll get more StatQuest content, like this live stream, but I'm also going to do more applied tutorials and Python and R, and I also, uh, I'm going to try to just crank out more StatQuest videos. I'm um, just going to do everything I can, uh, because i got a little bit more time to spend on StatQuest. Uh, the other thing I'm really excited about is now I have time to travel for StatQuest. So if you want me to come to your work or your school or whatever, let's do it. I think that'd be super fun. I have a special stat quest that I don't put online. It's not a video. Uh, I only do it in person. Um, so if you want to see that special stat quest, it'd be a good way to do it. Um, oh, I got too excited. Uh, let's get back to where this, why this is awesome. Okay, uh, I also I just love stat quest, so I'm excited about that I get to spend more time doing it. However... Doing StatQuest as a full-time job means I need your help. Um, one thing you can do to help me out, and this would be huge, is subscribe and click the like button. I know a lot of people ask uh, you to do that, uh, and now I'm asking you to do that too. Uh, I'd really appreciate it. Uh, you could also share StatQuest videos with your friends and loved ones and encourage them to subscribe as well. That would be huge. Uh, it's such a compliment when somebody uh, shares my videos with someone they like. Um, you can also support the channel as a member or via Patreon. And what those are, are um, for as little as a dollar a month, uh, you can help support me making StatQuest. And that's real important for me because it's, a, it's sort of like a, a known upfront source of income that I can have. So I'll know I'll have enough money to buy groceries at the end of the month, and StatQuest will then become sustainable. Uh, you can also contribute through Super Chat, um, and you can also get merch and t-shirts and whatnot, and you can also donate. So there's lots of options that you can help. Uh, subscribing and liking are probably the most important of those right now, but uh, um, but if you can do the others, that would be, that would be great too. All right, enough of this. Uh, let's just say BAM about how excited I am that I'm now doing StatQuest full-time and move on to the questions. So here's question number one. Anita Pollenberg. She asked, Do we use statistical models to predict or explain stuff? And how can I make the distinction clear in the methods I use? Okay, so in order to talk about this question or answer this question, we're going to do a linear regression. Uh, and we're going to predict and explain stuff. So we've got uh, weight and height. Uh, and first, we're going to predict stuff. So if you tell me you weigh this much, then I can use the linear regression line to predict that you are this tall. Bam. No big deal. We can also use linear regression to explain stuff. When we do a linear regression, we get an R-squared value and we get a P-value. The, this R-squared value, 0.7, tells us that 70% of the variation in height can be explained by weight. And the P-value tells us that if we randomly drew four dots on a bunch of graphs and calculated the R-squared value for each data set, oops, um, Oh, excuse me. I'm having a little technical difficulty with the slideshow over here, so uh, just bear with me. I'm sorry for all the, uh, the problems. Uh, uh, this is the first time I'm trying to like mix sort of traditional StatQuest plus the live stream aspect 
and we've got a couple of bumps in the road. Uh, so uh, hopefully we won't have too many more of those throughout. I think we're, I think we're probably going to have two more is my guess. Um, but you guys are cool. You just got to roll with it, right? Yeah. Okay, cool. So, um, so remember we, uh, um, we uh, we had some random data sets and we calculated uh, R squared values for all those random data sets. And uh, if we did that, then only uh, then th we would only get an R squared value greater than or equal to 0.7 two percent of the time. That's what that p value is telling us. So in other words, it's unlikely that the relationship between weight and height is due to chance. And even though correlation, in this case measured by R squared, is not causation, we still have some insight into our data. So this is how we can predict and explain stuff with linear regression. And we can easily make the distinction between predictions and explanations uh, by putting emphasis on the fact that we've made a prediction and we say, I predict you're this tall. Or we can put emphasis on the R squared value, where an R squared is used more for sort of explaining stuff and trying to tease out relationships in the data. Note, the same things can be said about logistic regression. If you said you weigh this much, then I will predict that there is a low probability that you are obese. So I can make a prediction. And also with logistic regression, we can calculate an R squared and a P value, and that'll tell us if there's a relationship between weight and the probability of obesity. Interestingly enough, decision trees can also make predictions and give us insight into our data. For example, this tree predicts whether or not someone will love the movie Troll 2 based on whether they like rom-coms, romantic comedies, and their astrological sign. However, the actual tree only uses likes rom-coms to make predictions. And if those predictions are good, then we have an idea that there's a relationship between rom-coms and loving or not loving Troll 2. And since uh, astrological sign was not used at all, then we have some sense that it's not as important for predicting if someone loves Troll 2. So, even though we did not calculate R squared or a p-value, we still got some insight into our data. So even sort of like the non-statistical uh, based methods can give us insight into our data. And so uh, we can use uh, regression trees or, uh, excuse me, uh, decision trees, regression trees, or random forest, stuff like that. Uh, if it gives us insight into our data, and a lot of those methods will, uh, even without a p-value. So, uh, and actually, I find my, I found myself using uh, alternative methods. I'll do this. I'll do the traditional linear models approach, but I've also used some of these machine learning methods to get some insight into my data and not just make predictions all the time. So, that's a cool thing to do. Bam! All right. Now we're ready for question number two. JM asked, can you show the effects of regularization? Note, regularization is a trick that we use to determine the best parameters for machine learning. And if you don't know what regularization is, it'd be a good time to go get a snack, but come back quick because the last question is for everybody and we're all going to learn a lot from that one. Uh, and also, um, if you don't know what regularization is, I would highly recommend checking out the stat quests on the subject because uh, it's one of the most important things in machine learning and it's used in all kinds of data analysis, not just machine learning, uh, but uh, statistical analyses as well. It's a general technique for dealing with lots of variables. Uh, so if you have a lot of things that can explain something like whether or not someone you're gonna like uh, troll to or not, um, Regularization is a standard uh, procedure for dealing with that situation. Okay, so we're going to go back to our weight and height data. Oh, hold on. My cat wants in the room. Hold on. Let me let the cat in. Hey, Pooh.
This is my cat. Okay, back to what we were doing. So, um, say like we fit this line to the data. I know that's a terrible uh, fit to the data. It's a horizontal line. It's about as bad a fit as you could possibly have. But it's a starting point. We're going to improve on it in just a little bit. Okay, now let's add the ridge regression, ridge regression penalty, a.k.a. the L2 norm. Oops. Okay, and if you asked me, it should be called the square penalty, because that's what we're doing. We're squaring the slope. The thick blue line represents lambda equals zero, so that means there's no extra penalty, because we multiply the square of the slope by lambda. So when lambda is zero, all we're back to just having the sum of the squared residuals. This thick orange line represents lambda equals 10, so we have in increased the penalty, and we see that the minimum value is closer to zero than before. In other words, the ridge regression penalty, <clears throat> the square penalty, shrunk the slope. The thick green line represents lambda equals 20, and we see that the minimum value is closer to zero, and the slope is shrunk some more. This thick purple line, lambda equals 40, uh, <clears throat> uh, excuse me, <laughs> the thick purple line represents, I, I left out the word line and that threw me off. Anyways, the thick purple line represents lambda equals 40. So now the penalty is quite large and we've shrunk the slope even more, okay? So we see that as we increase lambda, the optimal slope gets closer and closer to zero. Now let's see what happens when we use the lasso penny penalty, aka the L1 norm, or if you ask me, I'd call it the absolute value penalty because that's what we do. We take the absolute value of the slope. Okay, again, uh, the thick blue line represents when lambda equals zero, so there's no extra penalty because we, uh, we multiply the absolute value of the slope by lambda. So uh, the thick orange line represents lambda equals 10. So now we are turning on the penalty and shrinking the slope. The thick green line represents lambda equals 20. And the thick purple line represents lambda equals 40. Note, this is super important and is one of the big differences between uh, ridge and lasso or squaring the, the, the parameters versus taking the absolute value. Okay, the low point in the purple curve, aka the optimal slope given the absolute value penalty when lambda equals 40 is zero. And that means the slope of this line is zero. And that means that when lambda equals 40, then we, have, then we ignore weight as a variable when predicting height. So now let's compare the squared penalty, ridge, to the absolute value penalty, lasso. So on the left side, we see that when we increase lambda, the lowest point in the parabola shifts over towards zero, but the parabola still re retains its parabolic shape. It just sort of gets uh, scaled a little bit, uh, but it's still a nice sort of like curve. It dips down and it goes back up. In contrast, with the absolute value penalty, the lasso penalty on the right side, as we increase uh, lambda, we shift faster. We shift towards zero faster, and uh, we start losing that parabolic shape. And you see when lambda equals 40, we still got a little bit of curve, but it doesn't. we don't actually bottom out. We could imagine that curve still going, but we don't bottom out, and but where we do bottom, where we end, is at uh, zero. So, uh, and that's why we ended up uh, ignoring weight and kind of using a horizontal line at that point. So those are the two big differences between the squared ridge penalty and the absolute value lasso penalty. And uh, I hope these visualizations helped. I've seen other visualizations out there. I'll be honest, they don't make as much sense as these do to me. Um, so, uh, so hopefully that was helpful. 
and we'll give it the double bam. Double bam. Okay, question number three. This is from Shubham Borgair, and they want to know how I can choose the best machine learning algorithm for my bet for my data. So this is something you don't need to know regularization or anything fancy to, to appreciate the answer to this question. So uh, the most important thing is to become familiar with a bunch of different methods. So what I mean by that is um, you uh, go to scikit-learn or you find a repository of machine learning methods uh, for R or whatever programming language you like and you just pick one and you start with a simple data set and you get the method working and then you you know you then you just add a more complicated data set and see see if you can get a good feel for how uh, the machine learning method works and what its strengths and weaknesses are and if you're wondering well how do i even know where to start how do i know which uh, uh, machine learning algorithms to even like try i mean because there's a bunch where do you start uh, I'm going to address that uh, towards the end of the question. So we'll get, we'll come back to this uh, aspect of how do we even start out um, when we talk about the, when we get to the end of this question. Uh, so uh, that said, uh, aside from just trying a bunch of, bunch of methods and seeing what happens, here are some things to keep in mind when picking a machine learning algorithm. One thing to keep in mind is do you need the predictions do you need to make predictions quickly? Uh, for example, uh, are, is your machine learning in an autonomous car and it needs to know if it needs to hit the brakes or not? And those decisions need to be sometimes need to be made very, very quickly. Or is it the kind of machine learning algorithm where you can um, feed it your data and come back after lunch and it gives you a prediction and you're like, sweet, that's our prediction, bam. Okay, so if you're in no rush, um, versus you're in a huge rush to get predictions. Um, that can change which methods you use. Um, some methods like support vector machines can make predictions very quickly since they need relatively few calculations to make a decision. In contrast, random forests or any of the boost algorithms uh, might have a lot of calculations to do to get to a prediction. So. Um, so the, the speed at which you need a prediction can affect which method you choose. Um, another question you wanna ask yourself is, does learning have to be fast? Or uh, are, am I gonna update my model on the fly with new data? Methods like XGBoost are highly optimized, opti ah, excuse me, methods like XGBoost are highly optimized to be trained quickly. And that's very useful because that means you can uh, use cross-validation to find the hyperparameters and, and you can sort of tune uh, XGBoost pretty efficiently. So that's, a, that's something to keep in mind um, if that's something you need to do. Uh, methods that can be trained with stochastic gradient descent like linear regression or logistic regression or neural networks or any other method, there's a bunch of methods, uh, they can easily be updated with new data over time without having to start over. So those are great when um, you, you sort of train early on with a small data set, but you're continuing to gather more data uh, and uh, modify your how you're predicting. Um, so that's something to keep in mind as well, because some methods are better at doing that than others. Okay, a question you need to ask yourself is how big is the data set? If your data set is too small, then you might just need more data rather than a machine learning algorithm. And if your data set is very, very, very large, then you need a method like XGBoost that is designed to work with huge data sets. And I know I've mentioned XGBoost a billion times. Uh, I'm not necessarily endorsing it as my favorite method, but I'm just in the midst of working on StatQuest videos um, on XGBoost, so I'm thinking about it a lot. Um, so that's why I keep bringing it up. Oh, um, okay. I think we've I think we've made it through all of our slideshow fiascos, uh, and hopefully I'll have this smoothed out for the next live stream. Okay, okay. When you have several options to choose from and time to train multiple methods, uh, you should use tenfold cross validation to find the best one for your data. 
And last but not least, Scikit-Learn has an algorithm cheat sheet. And I'm sorry that uh, yours truly right here is cutting off part of that cheat sheet. But basically, it's a decision tree where if you know what, the, what kind of data you have and you know um, sort of what you want to do with that data and you know how much data you have, you just follow this decision tree and it leads you to a machine learning method. And this... Um, this cheat sheet is also a great way to figure out where to start um, when you're just trying to learn new machine learning algorithms. Uh, look at the ones here uh, and learn how they work. Um, so if you're really new to machine learning, this is a great resource uh, at many stages, right? At the very beginning, you can, you can use this as a way to learn and get familiar with new machine learning methods that you might not already know. Um, Anyway, so I'll ha I, I don't actually have the link for this in the description below yet, uh, but I will put that up as soon as I can. Uh, it'll probably be a couple of hours. Uh, actually, no, it'll be soon. I'll get it up soon. Triple bam. All right, now it's time for some viewer questions. Um, I'm just going to look over the chat over here and... Uh, oh. Here's a question, a very apropos question. Uh, JN said, do I prefer Patreon or YouTube memberships? Uh, or is it exactly the same? Um, they are different. Um, Patreon, um, they are different. So I, all, I think the big difference is YouTube takes a larger commission than Patreon. Um, so uh, with YouTube, uh, Patreon, I get more of the money comes to me and less of it goes to Patreon itself. Whereas uh, with YouTube memberships, more of the money goes to YouTube than comes to, I mean, they, uh, YouTube basically takes 30% and I think Patreon takes a 10 or 15 or something like that. It's, it's, it's different. So, but the, uh, that's being said, I know that YouTube memberships are much easier for a lot of people. And if that's the easiest thing for you to go for it, I treat both, uh, YouTube and Patreon subscribers the same. Uh, you get the same perks. You get you get early access. So so um, uh, some of you guys probably have already seen the latest XG Boost uh, video. It's been out uh, for a little over a week now, and it'll probably be in early access for another week before I make it uh, public. Um, so that's one of the perks. Uh, you also can get uh, acknowledgments in the videos, uh, acknowledgement on the website. I've also got something crazy for people that are incredibly wealthy. Uh, you get uh, uh, a collection of a lot of silly songs, my favorite silly songs. Uh, so that's kind of a fun perk. Um, but but really, it's 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 not really about um, um, necessarily the perks. Uh, well, maybe maybe you do it for the perks. Anyways, um, let's see what else we got. Um, uh, someone else is asking about PayPal details. I have a link uh, for that in the in the description of all my videos. It's you just kind of go to the description and scroll down. Uh, I'm also going to try to put a link for that on my website, um, so that should be pretty easy. Um, uh, someone asked if I could uh, make a, a video about gradient a gradient booster, um, and. I hate to say it, I think I already have that video ready to go. Um, so just check my website. I've got an index of all my videos, and you can just find the one for Gradient Boost and go for it. Um, um, what else do we got up here? Uh, oh. Someone asked, do we have to handle outliers before handling null values in a data set or the other way? Um, you know, that's a good question. Um, and I'm not necessarily certain how to answer that off the top of my head. I will say, um, I think the process is you take care of the null values first if you're removing them. And if you're imputing them, then you need to get rid of the outliers first. Does that make sense? Um, to be honest, I would—I guess you could always remove the outliers first because if if you're just removing null 
um, you know, missing data with, uh, you're just removing those samples that have the missing data. It doesn't matter uh, what the outliers say. Uh, but when you're imputing data, it does. So in either case, um, get rid of the outliers and then remove the missing data. Uh, and then, or deal with the missing data. You can either remove it or you can impute. Um, so yeah, hooray, I answered that question. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, what else do we got? Extreme gradient boosting videos? Yes, I already have two and there's a third one out. So you were lucky. And if you become a member, you get early access to that third video. And I've got a fourth one coming out for early access in a week or two. And I'm really excited about that. Um, oh, here's a question. Am I a professor in real life? I was. I was up until last Friday. Um, I was a research assistant professor at UNC in genetics. And now I am a StatQuest um, guy. I'm a StatQuest guy. That's what I do. I do StatQuest. Um, so uh, let's see if we got a couple other questions. Maybe I can scroll over here in the chat window. Got a lot of stuff going over here. Um, hmm. Holy smokes. Um, <laughs> someone in, in Portugal uh, uh, was viewing at 2 a, uh, 2 a, 2.07 a.m. Um, that's crazy. Um, what else we got over here? Oh, videos on neural networks. Those are coming out in the spring, uh, in a couple of months. When I finish the XG Boost videos, I'm gonna do a couple of odds and ends. I've got some new p-value videos that are uh, that are coming out. I've got one on something called UMAP, which is a way of visualizing really complicated data sets. Um, and, oh, uh, Naive Bayes. So I'm gonna have a, a handful of kind of like short videos. Naive Bayes is like a super short method, uh, simple method. Uh, so we won't spend long with that. And once we've gotten through those little ones, we're gonna do uh, neural networks. And I'm really excited about that. I've been, I've been talking about doing it for years and uh, it's really exciting to finally be like right on the edge of doing it. So that's exciting. Um, what else we got? Um, Long-term stuff. Uh, oh yeah, someone asked if we're gonna do Bayesian statistics. Um, I think at some point we will. Um, we're gonna obviously we're gonna do naive Bayes uh, pretty soon, uh, and I'm pretty excited about that. Although I'll be honest, even though it's called naive Bayes, and whenever you, if you if you Google naive Bayes and you look at any of the instructions, they all teach you about the Bayesian. Um, Oh, I can't even remember what it's called, but it's basically the Bayesian formula, the foundation of Bayesian statistics. Um, and then they say, but all the, uh, all, you know, they, then they say they make all these crazy assumptions. You end up with something that's hardly Bayesian at all. Um, so it's kind of cheating to say you're doing Bayesian uh, when you're using naive Bayes. Um, but we'll get to that one of these days. Uh, it's something, to be honest, I've wanted to learn more about as well. Uh, it's... Um, yeah, it's something I've wanted to learn about as much as well. Um, someone asked, is PCA applicable only for unsupervised learning? Uh, and the answer to that is uh, no. You can use it all the time. And I use it all the time for, uh, for supervised things. Uh, I use it, uh, well, I used to when I was working in the lab um, to verify that an experiment worked properly. Uh, they'd have a bunch of uh, experiments and they'd be labeled uh, based on some feature like these, these, uh, these samples were taken uh, from cells that were given this drug and these samples were taken from uh, a pool of cells that were given another drug. So I've got three of each. Uh, and I'll do PCA to make sure they cluster appropriately in an, even though I know what, how they should cluster. And so it's, uh, so it's kind of, supervised, I'll turn that off and make sure that they're clustering properly. Um, however, if I want to take advantage of those labels of the fact that these cells had uh, one drug given to them and these this pool of cells had another drug coming to them, I would use something like linear discriminant analysis to kind of take advantage of the fact that I know the different categories. Um, so 
I hate to say goodbye, uh, but I'm going to give this a bonus bam, and then I'm going to say the end, uh, because I'm trying to keep these to 30 minutes, and my voice is giving out uh, by this second. I don't think I can talk much longer. Uh, so uh, I hate, I always hate to end these things, but we're going to have to end now. I'll, I'll stick with the chat for a little bit if you guys want to keep chatting. Uh, it's always fun to participate in that. And until next time, quest on.